Okay, I think that is most of us that will be here. We'll, um, I'm sure we'll have a few more people filter in, but as long as they do so quietly, that's okay. Um, so we will be starting off uh, this session on management uh, very shortly. I'm chairing the session. I'm James. Um, my job is basically to hold up numbers so the speakers don't overrun too much. Um, we're starting with Shizlan, who will be talking about uh, a long-term project and the lessons learned from that. So, go ahead. All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Gislain. I'm an RSE from France. I work at the Paris Brain Institute. And uh, quite recently, um, I read online uh, that um, most software project fails and was a bit surprised by this and um, saw this 2020 chaos report, which is basically a report on IT projects that run in the, in the private sector. And it turns out that two out of three projects fails for many reasons, over budget, over time, unrealistic expectations or, or staff turnover. Um, so I sat with my team and we, we wondered how come that uh, our own research software project uh, uh, was successful. So we, um, we um, identified some of the successes that we're proud of, the software, some of the pitfalls that we're trying to address, and uh, some of the lessons that we've learned and all we're trying to apply. And we thought it would be, uh, it would be useful to share it with the community at large, hence this talk. Um, I have to make the following disclaimer. Uh, your mileage may vary, so we're all engineers with different uh, level of expertise, so you might agree with all, partly or none of what I'm going to say, and that's fine. Um, and also this talk will feature some memes. So let's move on to our case study. So I work on a project called Clinica. Uh, the, its tagline is a software platform for clinical neuroimaging studies. We have a paper associated with the software that uh, people using the software can cite. Uh, there's an official website where people can get information and it's a Python package, so it's just an easy pip install away. Uh, and in a nutshell, the software provides uh, two pieces of functionality. One is a bunch of converters that will use, uh, can, that can, you can use to convert uh, popular neuroimaging data sets such as the UK Biobank, for instance to a standardized data structure that is the lingua franca of the neuroimaging community called BIDS. And uh, from this data structure, you can run a set of pipelines that will generate derived data, such as uh, uh, brain tissue maps or volumetric statistics that then can be fed to statistical models or machine learning models that are designed by our research staff. The code is hosted on GitHub. It's released under an open source license. Uh, it started as an internal tool in the lab. Uh, the first commit happened in April 2017, and the first tag released about a year later. And it's still actively developed to this day. Um, which makes me move on to the successes. And the, the first one is that it's still being actively developed six years later. Um, before it was your typical like research project becoming a software package. Uh, it was uh, designed by one PhD student that then became a postdoc and late, late afterwards uh, moved on to industry. There was also one engineer helping him. Project management was rather loose and re the release cadence was ad hoc. Uh, Today, we have a proper, properly structured uh, engineering team composed of one team lead and three engineers. We are following an agile style project management uh, um, framework where we do uh, sprints of six to eight weeks, at the end of which there's a release being, being made. So our release cadence is now more steady. Um, we also have a growing community of users that expands beyond our internal lab. We have um, more and more issues and support requests coming from other institutions. Uh, we keep a public record of these past uh, support requests so that we build a knowledge base then, uh, that uh, uh, people can use over time. 
we're sharing all our design decisions publicly over GitHub discussions, which means that anyone in the community who's interested in the future of where Clinica is going can interact with us uh, by responding to the discussion threads. And we're getting involved in our software dependencies. We, we stand on the shoulders of giants. We use uh, tools from the rest of the neuroimaging community. And whenever we can, we forward upstream bug reports or fixes. And although it wasn't an objective at the beginning uh, of, of, the, of the project, um, we, we are quite happy that we are uh, aligning with the FAIR software principles, some of them. Um, our releases are produced from publicly available tag commits, so uh, everyone can reproduce our release. Um, it's available, the packages and metadata are available through the Python package index. Uh, we adopted the BIT standard to uh, allow for interop interoperability with other neuroimaging tools. And we use advanced project management uh, tools like Poetry to be able to uh, reproduce runtime environments. Now moving on to the pitfalls. Um, the first one is the most recent one we faced. We gave uh, a software tutorial at OHBM in June. And uh, we, uh, our users were quite confused uh, about the scope of the project and that gave, gave them a, a wrong first impression of whether Clinica could be useful for them or not. Um, and the reason could be from the fact that if we read the README, so re README reads as a software platform for clinical research studies involving patients with neurological and psychiatric diseases and the acquisition of multimodal data, most often with longitudinal follow-up. That's quite a mouthful, and there's a lot of jargon in it. Um, whereas we can compare this with the paper, which was written way more recently than this project statement. And here things are, are way more structured. It reads clinic aims uh, for researchers to one, spend less time on data management and processing, two, perform reproducible evaluations of their methods, and three, easily share data and results with their institution and with external collaborators. Which made us wonder what's a good scope? Um, and in our opinion, it should answer some questions like, what's the target audience? What are the covered use cases by your software project? And what are its notable features? And I would argue that the paper definitely answers that better than the README or the website. Another one is that after working for now more than a year on the Clinica code base, it proved to be challenging to extend. Um, the code is rather fragile, uh, mostly focused on the happy path, so when everything goes, goes right, and there's very little validation logic or error handling. Um, extension of the code base usually happens by copy-pasting, which means that whenever you have to fix an issue, you need to find every single replica of the code affected by the bug. And finally, testing coverage is insufficient. And the issue is, is particularly annoying if your code base is uh, implemented with a dynamic language, like Python, for instance, where you only catch bugs when the, this part of the code is being exercised. And also the code itself um, is difficult to maintain. That we have part of the documentation which is insufficient or outdated. Um, sometimes the original author, uh, a postdoc for instance, of a piece of code actually left. Um, and uh, an experiment which led to the code being produced is impossible to, to reproduce. So you, you have the same data, uh, you run the same code and the output data is different. So you have this work on my machine effect happening. I'm guessing everyone has faced one or all of these issues. I, I see some heads nodding. Um, and, and the thing is, when we look back at the successes and, and pitfalls, um, we think they come from the result from the significant investments, or sometimes lack thereof, in three major axes. Uh, one is code, one is communication, and the last one is in people. Um, we'll start with code. Um, and I let Guido do the talking where he famously said in PEP8 that we should design code for readability. 
code is read much more often than it is written. And I think you, you've all been in that, uh, in, in that state where you've been handed over a piece of code, which could be yours from six months ago, and you're like, goodness me, what the hell is happening in this? We should also enforce good practices, and good practices is a very, like a very wide umbrella term. So I'm giving you like these, I'd say, free getting started steps. One is to make sure that the code you write is idiomatic in the language you write it in. Um, the reason is simple, using familiar constructs in your language would help you with something called knowledge chunking. Um, for every one of you who's doing programming, I would highly recommend the book The Programmer's Brain in Manning Publication, which actually like gives you insight on how cognitively our, our brain works when we write code or read code. And that, that's a concept that's being used, the concept of knowledge chunking. Another thing that is very de detrimental to our cognitive load is inconsistent code. So uh, usually these things can be easily automated away. So keeping the code consistent is not that much of an investment. It's just automation at the end of the day. And finally, there's uh, understanding the, the solid principles, which gives you a taxonomy to talk about uh, code quality uh, within a project. It's really, really worthwhile to understand uh, what they mean. They are applicable to every uh, programming paradigm, whether you're doing object-oriented programming, functional programming, or procedural comp programming. Your code will benefit from applying these principles. Keep technical depth under control. Um, technical depth is the, this concept of prioritizing for short-term gains, um, but these short-term gains, you will eventually have to repay them in the long term one way or another. Um, technical debt in itself is not bad. Actually, it's unavoidable. I, like the, f the only way to avoid technical debt is not write any code. Um, but technical debt should be managed, um, and the best way to do this is to always be refactoring. Um, Every changes in the code should be compared to the rest of the code base to make sure that it, um, it uses the appropriate data structure and it doesn't repeat any code that is already there. And finally, there's the knowing your dependencies. Most of your software projects use external dependencies, deport piece of functionalities to a third party. And that's similar to contracting a loan with unknown interests. Uh, you need to, you, you're putting some trust into this dependency, knowing that there's a risk that, that one, way, one day it's going to go away. And in that case, that burden will be shifted back on you. Um, and I think there are very little of us that have started with a greenfield project. So you will always start from an existing piece of code, which we will call legacy code. and you'd have to estimate what the current technical depth of that code is and be sure that it is properly managed. Um, there's investing in communication, uh, first of all, to your users. Uh, and first point would be to have a clear project statement, which we are trying to improve at Clinica. Uh, usually it starts with writing a good readme. Um, also, people, depending on your code, will need to know, like any software project is always in flux. There are very little software projects that are called done. So there will always be a, 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 a steady stream of improvements and fixes happening in your dependencies. So you need to communicate this change effectively, especially those that are new, new features, fixes to existing features, or breaking changes. And finally, enforcing a strict scope. Um, users will give you new use cases that they would like your software project to tackle. And sometimes you'd have to learn to say no, which is always difficult. Uh, communication to your collaborators. Um, each, each software team is different, so there's not really a one size fits all. Everyone says, yeah, you should be doing agile with this framework and stuff doesn't really work like this in experience. It's better to just let effective collaboration emerge from the team. Um, 
Something that's common, however, is to make sure you have a transparent task management in place, whether it's through uh, a ticketing system or your GitHub issues or uh, Jira or whatever. Uh, but it should be clear at all time who does what. And finally, your engineers also have a tendency to want to enlarge the scope. So to them also, you'd have to learn to say no. And finally, your managers. Um, uh, for that, um, something that's been very effective at, for, for Clinica has been to first and foremost formalize and adopt something called the ubiquitous language. That's a term coined in domain-driven design that I've learned from the private sector. And the idea is that that language, uh, you speak with your project managers, it should be translated word for word in the code. So if there's something lost in translation, that's not good. Uh, you should report progress, not technical advancements. Usually they don't really care about this. And they also have a tendency to say, what if the project did this? What if the project did that? So again, learn to say no. And finally, invest in people. Um, Damien Conway from Pearl fame uh, famously said, documentation is love letter that you write to your future self. And he's, if anyone has worked with his own code base from six months ago, that's, that's definitely true. Um, also, your software team will be in flux. New people will join and old people will leave. So you should put in place the knowledge base to make sure that uh, onboarding of newcomers is facilitated. Uh, for that, what we do is we maintain a, a living documentation uh, and we use pair programming at the beginning to pair the, the newcomers with someone who's already experienced with the code base. Um, develop skills through continuous learning. Um, we dedicate in the sprints some time to basically go and explore a specific feature or a specific piece of functionality that we would like to get into Clinica. Um, and we, at the end of the day, we, uh, we create a proof of concept or a targeted experimentation and learn from it, decide whether we want that in the project or it's too complicated and we want that away. And finally, uh, ensure that knowledge is passed when the collaborators leave. That works really well if you do systematic code reviews. Um, and also we do regular, regular internal presentations once new features uh, land in. And finally, collect external feedback. Uh, feedback is one of the pillars of agility. Um, basically, the idea is that unreleased code is as useful as dead code. Um, it should be straightforward uh, for your users where to request uh, help or report issues. Um, and we should welcome any contribution from, from outside. Uh, we, and we should also value any form of contributions including non-code ones. Uh, basically, even a typo is worth fixing. Um, and if your software project is successful, um, then congratulations. Like You're part of the one third <laughs> who've managed to have a successful project. So now you can sit back, relax, and do another game called Blame the User. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. I hope you, you, you find some of these advices uh, useful, and I welcome your questions. Thank you very much. So as Marion changes the, there we go. Um, so we'll be doing questions through Slido. Um, so please uh, go to that Slido thing, and we will um, answer your questions when uh, we have some. Uh, but to get started, and I suspect I'll ask this question to the next speakers as well, uh, you mentioned technical debt. Do you have any tips for how to identify the level of technical debt in a project? If you don't have tests, you have a lot of technical debt. That's like the one main, uh, I'd say, uh, warning level that you should find. If you don't have tests, you basically can't refactor with, uh, with uh, uh, good confidence. Um, so you, you're essentially contracted like the, the biggest debt ever. 
Uh, do you collect some of the principles you presented into a handbook or a shared resource of some kind? Um, if you, uh, like most of these principles, they are well uh, documented in, uh, in, in books like, uh, the top of my mind, uh, there's the, um, there's the book from, there's Martin Fowler's uh, blog posts are really good. Uh, there's Uncle Bob's books uh, as well in the O'Reilly uh, ones. I don't, I don't have their titles on top of my head, but there are, there's quite an extensive uh, book collections on um, software crafting in general. Um, how do you estimate how much time will be spent to develop features? Um, Usually what we do is um, we do early at the sprint, we do a sprint planning where all four of us uh, meet and look at the tasks and the work packages we want to work on. And we basically chunk these tasks to like the, the, the smallest piece, the small testable piece, piece possible. And those usually should be in the area of a week or a few days to do. So if we combine them together, it should roughly equal to the length of the sprint. That's one way of doing it. Um, not quite sure that question, the, the capital investment thing, I'm not quite sure I understand that question, so. I can't explain it in 160 characters. So a lot of the proposals that you made like um, refactor the code or document, they involve a cost. Like it takes time to do that, and one, ho one hopes it gets repaid later. Do you have any examples of you know, an enormous capital cost you might, like something big that you might do once that then pays back on, on, on the code forever? I mean, your documentation, I, I don't know if, do, do you, for instance, for us, since all our issues and support requests are, are public, we know what the cost of the weaknesses in our documentation are because we know how many issues we've had about a particular piece of documentation that was missing. So just that alone, like just having this way of saying, because we didn't write that piece of documentation, we've had that many support requests that account to that many hours of work spent addressing them instead of developing, that should give you a rough idea of the cost of outdated documentation or uh, a test that wasn't there that created uh, um, a regression in your code that you have to fix that was costly to find. Um, these, of course, will vary from, from the issue at hand. Um, but by experience, you basically learn to know that yeah, you're, if you don't document your code or if you don't test, you're going to pay it at some point or another. But it's difficult, I would say, to like, if the aim is, for instance, to motivate your manager that you need to spend some time uh, doing refactoring because we're going to have a trouble later, um, it's better to just like have a known use case when that happens, for ex example, within your community or within a known project and use that as, a, as an example, for instance. I don't know if that answers exactly your question, but. I would say it's difficult to quantify, but there are enough feedback from uh, the development community that like, technical debt is an issue and should be addressed regularly as, instead of as a one-off thing. How do you explain technical debt to your managers? Um, everything you need to do that is not your prerogatives as a software developer. <laughs> um, it, it is. It is. Uh, it is a tough thing, and uh, we've had that uh, that uh, question for a while with our own manager, where we've had issues, for instance, with our regression tests uh, completely failing, and having to explaining that yes, we need to fix them because otherwise what we're going to do afterwards with the code might introduce more regressions later. Um, there's not really a recipe, you just need to find the right words and usually experience will, will be helpful. Um, do I have one more time for the last one? So um, 
Ubiquitous language, uh, that's something that I've learned by studying a little bit domain-driven design. So there's quite a bit of uh, um, uh, documentation and, uh, and um, literature about the subject. So what I would advise is to, uh, to, to uh, Google and search uh, domain-driven design. It's, it helps a lot in, it's basically this, um, the study of software crafting and, uh, and uh, the patterns we can find uh, in the art of doing software. So it's, it's very much applicable to any piece of software that you can, you can write. So it's very worth investigating. Thank you. Thank you very much.